Good evening. We welcome each and every one of you into the Lord's house. Very kindly, those who are guests in our midst, this is your Father's house, and here you are always welcome. In our intercessions today, we will include a prayer that God would guide this, your pastor, in his uh, study retreat, where I establish the spiritual menu for the next year, if you will, for you. May God bless me. May the weather be rainy and cold, so I won't feel like going fishing, but stick my nose to the work. So I invite your prayers for that. And we continue to pray for God to have mercy on us and heal our nation of all the ills that are assaulting it. It seems all of a sudden we have attacks from every side. May he have mercy on us and hear our prayers for America and for the world. Let us now begin. Please stand. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. 
and the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests of the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and love from the Lord Jesus. Amen. The text is from this very difficult gospel lesson for this evening. Jesus said to them, the Pharisees, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the text. My dear brother and sister, of course, there is no word to describe the stupidity and the wickedness of these tenants of the vineyard. What were they thinking? Come, let's kill the emissaries, the representatives of the owner. What were they thinking? They wanted the vineyard, but they rejected the owner and the rules that he imposed. It is beyond comprehension, is it not? The Pharisees 
representatives of the people of Israel in this instance, in this exchange with Jesus, did exactly that. They wanted the holy land that God gave them. And he drove out the Jebusites and the Hittites and the Ammonites and every other type of ites and gave the land to his people. Here it is. Now honor me. Do you know what was going on? They eventually were using idols and statues of idols in the temple that was dedicated to God. They were worshiping idols and offering sacrifices to idols. Manasseh, one of their kings, sacrificed several of his children to these idols to make the crops produce better and the rain to fall more often. Imagine that. Actually, he is the one that is credited with killing Isaiah. Sawed in two. In Hebrews 11, some were sawed in two. Isaiah one was one of them. We believe the apostle Paul was another. The prophet Jeremiah, they threw in a cistern and forgot about him until somebody found his human remains yet died of hunger. When Jesus is carrying his cross to die for the people of Jerusalem and for the people of the whole world, the women were running after him and crying. And he said, daughters of Jerusalem, don't cry for me, cry for yourselves. You've never seen a prophet that you did not hate. Look the treatment as the first great prophet there, Moses received in the desert from the people of Israel. We have no leeks. We miss the onions we used to eat in Egypt. What is this type of menu? Just bread? So God gives them quail. We have no water. Moses hits the rock. Out comes water. For every request, God, with his long-suffering love and mercy, answered to them. Did they learn anything? The answer is a flat no. So now Jesus knows what they are going to do. They killed all the emissaries of the owner before him. He is the son, and he knows that he will be killed by them, by the uh, Pharisees. Actually, four days after this parable was said, the Pharisees arrested him, and five days after this parable was taught, they crucified him. And while they crucified him, they were jeering him, mocking him, hurling insults at him. What were they thinking? Let's get rid of the sun, and then we can do as we please in our land? Well, 40 years after this, Rome had had enough with their shenanigans and just flattened Jerusalem. It just raised it. The capstone, the cornerstone that the builders rejected, has become the most important stone. The stone the builders rejected becomes the cornerstone. Nowadays, engineering and the building techniques have changed greatly, but in those days, the capstone was the all-important one. It did not only sustain the building, but it was also the stone that determined the placement the spot for every other stone in the construction. It became a reference to the rest of the stones. Every stone was placed in reference to the capstone that determined the level and the direction. 
this capstone that the builders rejected is Jesus Christ. And when the Pharisees perceived that he was talking about them, they became irate and tried to find a way to kill him quietly. But the only mediator between God and us is Jesus Christ. And when you reject him and start looking for another savior, you are in for disappointment because there is no other. There is one mediator between men and God, the man, God, Jesus Christ. That's how simple this doctrine is. If you reject Christ, you reject eternal life. You reject the way of salvation that God the Father in his unending love established. But here we see again how little we are and how great God is. God allowed them to arrest his son, to kill him. They meant it for evil. Crucify him, crucify him. No, release to us Barabbas. That's how nasty that was. God allowed that. They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, for the good of the whole world. He allowed his son to die. There are things in our lives that we will never understand. But trust me, God knows it all. And there is a purpose in everything. And there is nothing so evil or nasty that God cannot transform into good. Even the things that I meant for evil, to get to somebody, to push somebody's buttons, to provoke them to ire, to get even with them. God takes some of those instances and transforms them into good. Joseph's brothers didn't like him. Ah! Uh, he was a spoiled brat in their eyes. And they demonized him. By that I mean they thought if we get rid of him, our problems are solved. Because Jacob clearly was favoring his oldest son with his dear wife, pretty wife, Rachel. The ones with Leah were the older, big ugly brothers of Joseph and little Benjamin, who, when he was born, Rachel, his mom, died giving birth to him. They meant it for evil. They put him in a dry well and waited for a caravan of uh, traders to come by. They came, they stopped them, said, would you like to buy a good, healthy slave? They said, sure, let's make a buck. And they paid for Joseph, took him to Egypt, and sold him as a slave. There you know the thing went from bad to worse. He became kind of like the house boy, the administrator of the chief of police's household, Potiphar's household. Potiphar's wife had eyes for little Joseph and tempted him. And when he said, how could I do something this evil and sin against my God? He had learned from home that the sixth commandment, who would still be coming, was already in effect. And he ran away, and she grabbed his shirt and cried out of rage. How could he humiliate me like this? And when the chief of police came home, he said, honey, what's wrong? And she said, this Hebrew slave was getting fresh with me. All a lie. And then it gets worse. Joseph ends up in prison. For two years. And behind it all was God. God had planned it all to save Israel 
from the famine that would assault the Holy Land where Joseph lived, Jacob and his sons lived. Eventually, you know how they came all to live in Egypt and had the best land and everything was fine. When Joseph, Joseph's father died, his big brothers went to him and said, Oh, our father said, forgive your, your brothers. And he said, I have forgiven you long ago. You meant it for evil, but God made it for good to save many lives. God's plan, far-reaching, very deep. Just last week we saw about God through Isaiah also saying, my ways are not your ways, neither my, are your thoughts my thoughts, says the Lord. Yeah? We can never achieve that. So you and I are modern wine dressers. Have we learned a lesson from the old, wicked, ugly ones in, at the time of Jesus? I definitely hope we have. Because we trust him. And we hear when he, through his minister, says, your sins are forgiven. The burden from your shoulders is lifted off. You have a brand new beginning every time you hear the word of forgiveness. And every time you humble yourself before God and ask for forgiveness. A new beginning, unlimited times. God doesn't forgive seven times. It's more like 70 times seven per hour or so. The Pharisees wanted to keep the vineyard, the holy land, but they rejected the owner and the owner's rules. You and I bow before the Son. We welcome him, we worship him, we adore him as our Lord and Savior. We need him, and we believe his promises. And he said that he would go and prepare a place for us in the Father's mansions. And when he goes and prepares a place for us, he will come back and take us to be with him, that we also may be where he is. I'm waiting. But until the day that he calls me, I'll be proclaiming through sermons, attitudes, or words in my daily life that Christ alone is Lord and he wants you and me now to go into every nation and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name. That's our privilege. May God bless our work. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of God, which is greater than all human understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Let us now stand and confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, that he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Good Lord and Father, hear us for the sake of your Son, Jesus. We thank you for your grace that you announce again and again in your word. It fills our hearts with joy to know that we are forgiven. We thank you for sustaining the ministry among us here and we find rest 
for our wearied souls whenever we meet with you. Keep us steadfast in the Christian faith. And bless our work as we proclaim repentance and the forgiveness of sins in every nation. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we join Laura Schmitz in honoring you in memory of her sainted mother, Barbara Miller. We also join Mark and Dora Monreal, who honor you with a gift in acknowledging that from you all good comes in their holy matrimony of 35 years. We also join Chuck and Carol Weber, who sponsor special missions. We pray that your blessing would be upon these, your dear children, in the years ahead as they have in the past. Strengthen each one of them, and if it is your will, Father, let Chuck recover from his illness that he may return to the warmth of their home. Lord, in your mercy, our nation is undergoing many changes and dangers. We are suffering from storms and fires and social unrest and inequality and illness, besides political dissension. There are some problems that you alone can solve, and we appeal to you, the highest court in the land, that you would enable us to find a solution for each problem. Lord, in your mercy, protect all health workers and all those whose work is essential. First responders, firefighters, policemen, policewomen, relief workers, factory workers, teachers, students, and all who need your help. We pray you to keep them safe. Lord, in your mercy, guide and bless this, your servant, as he seeks to assemble a series of messages for the year ahead. Let your Holy Spirit guide him with a firm hand. Lord, in your mercy. As for those of ours who are in need of medical attention and are named in our bulletin, we give them into your hands. Help them as you see fit. Strengthen them in their faith. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.